and welcome back to the Colquitt series on robust and beneficial artificial intelligence, uh, co-hosted by Machine Intelligence Research Institute and Future Command Institute. Our first speaker today is, uh, is Bart Selman, professor of computer science at Cornell University uh, and a prolific researcher in the areas of scaling and computational sustainability, knowledge representation uh, and tractable inference and much more. And we are also very pleased to have him as a research advisor uh, for us here at MIRI. Uh, so, he's here today to, to discuss current progress in machine reasoning and human understanding of such. And so, I uh, join me in welcoming Professor Bart Selman. Okay. Okay, thanks. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's uh, my first time, but it looks like a very nice place. So, uh, so I'll talk uh, probably a little different than, than, than some of the other talks. My area is, is machine reasoning, knowledge representation. Um, and it gets less press than machine learning, uh, but the progress has still been dramatic, and I'm actually looking forward to the time and that's starting to happen when we start combining machine learning and machine reasoning. Um, but so I'll focus on machine reasoning. Um, so mostly when we think of AI, we think of human intelligence, and, and I like to say that's because we that's the intelligence we know. Um, and you know, we split, we, we boil it down to perception, learning, reasoning, planning, knowledge, um, and of course, the current uh, uh, advance in machine learning, especially deep learning, uh, is really it has really changed what we thought we could do, uh, at least in perception uh, and learning, if we have enough data. Um, so, um, so that's very encouraging, and, and actually, a lot of. Uh, the, the, the concerns about AI, about AI safety and, and where things are going, are of course driven by these advances. Um, um, I, I like to, to look at, at what I call non-human intelligence. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's just get less attention, but, but the advances also have been, have been very interesting. Uh, and they're in reasoning and planning. Uh, so, uh, uh, it, it's actually partly not getting as much attention in the AI world because it's more used in software verification, program synthesis, uh, and I'll talk about automating science and mathematical discovery. So it's sort of other areas um, related to AI but not central uh, part of AI that are using these reasoning technologies. Uh, but uh, especially the software verification world, uh, the, the, the Microsoft and the Intel uh, and IBM push push these reasoning programs very hard, uh, and that's why there's there's so much progress. And I think it will start feeding back into AI in the in the near future. Um, so these de these developments are really not motivated by human intelligence. They're they're really motivated by just getting capabilities uh, like. You know, verification capabilities, proving programs correct, uh, verifying parallel protocols. Uh, we don't really care. Uh, we don't really. We're not really concerned with how humans would do it, or even if humans could do it. We just want to want to verify these these systems. Um, so it's it's really uh, you know it, it has a different motivation than, than a lot of uh, AI work. Okay. Um, and it's totally machine focused, okay? So the tasks are, you know, verify this code, synthesize this code. Uh, and and the, the difference, you know, in the last 10, 15 years is uh, we have systems that can do uh, billions of little inference steps in, in, in an intelligent way. Uh, you know, I've, my early work was in planning. Uh, and early planners, and this is you know, going way back to early 1990s, uh, uh, the planning system could do plans with, you know, they had the robots that, that would do little block stacking tasks, and they could do, you know, 10 step plans, you know, maybe 15 step plans, um, and that's where these systems would really stop, and planning was sort of considered too hard. Um, that's completely changed. Last 10, 20 years now, we can do plans with, uh, you know, a thousand steps optimally, uh, 10,000 steps if you want near optimal plans. So we can generate plans that are way beyond any human capability, so humans could not um, uh, synthesize plans of that size. Um, now, there's still, there's still many issues in planning that, that need to be addressed, uh, but in certain areas, certain sub-areas of planning, where you need these very long plans, very intricate plans, uh, uh, we've seen tremendous progress. Okay? And it will have an impact on robotics. Uh, so, 
I want to discuss a particular example of a reasoning problem, just to give you a flavor of what's feasible uh, nowadays, and I think it's just the beginning in many ways. Uh, so, uh, you might have seen it, it's, it's the Erdos uh, discrepancy problem. How many of you have seen the Erdos discrepancy problem? It's vaguely heard of it. Okay, great. Uh, so, but, but I'm just going to illustrate it with a little example. So, consider this sequence here of minus ones, plus ones, uh, et cetera. It's a, sort of randomly, I've picked them. Uh, but we're going to imagine a very long sequence uh, of, of minus ones and plus ones, okay? Um, then uh, I'm going to look at basically sums. We're going to lo look at sums of, of sequences and subsequences. In particular, let me illustrate it. The green ones, these are just they're taking every term of the sequence. And I'm going to look at, so the first two terms, okay, minus one plus one, uh, zero. Um, and now we're going to make the third term, plus one gets one, four minus one gets zero, uh, et cetera. So we're making, we're looking at the subsums going, you know, from left to right, okay? And you see here the outcome of these sums. And I hope this is correct. I give this talk. A few weeks ago, where I had mistakes on these additions, uh, which just caused embarrassment. But I think now I've double-checked that, uh, and and I think it works. Um, so, um, and you see, it, it it goes up and down this sum. Okay. Now, to make it a little more interesting, uh, we're also going to look at at subsequences where you where you jump a space. So in this case, I'm going to jump one space, uh, skip by one, okay? In the red sequence later on, I'm going to jump two spaces. So I started two, four, six, eight, three, six, nine, twelve, etc. Uh, but I'm going to again pick the term. So one plus uh, minus one, zero, plus one, one, uh, eight plus one gives two, etc. So I'm going to look at the subs the subsums of, of these terms selected you know, the, the top one is really the key one, uh, plus minus one, and the others are just the indices, okay? And again, you get these sums, okay, uh, going, okay? So, um, ah, so basically, so, so I'm, I'm in general. So what, what Erdos was, was asking is, um, you know, you see these sums growing. I actually, I don't, you know, if I had a few more minus ones here, this would could go down to minus one, minus two. Uh, but Erdos' discrepancy problem, which, which he considered, I think, around 1950, 1940s, roughly, uh, is can you find sequences where the sum stays within plus two and minus two, okay? So how long can you make this sequence uh, that all these subsequences, and, and you know, there, there can be many of, Sometimes, you know, they can jump by, by hundreds, by two hundreds, they can make, there, there are a tremendous number of them. Uh, anything that fits into the sequence you've selected, uh, can you always keep that sum uh, within minus two and plus two, okay? That was the question, okay? Um, and this is one of these reasoning results. So, in 2015, it was shown that there exists a sequence of 1160 plus ones and minus one, such that the sum of all the subsequences is uh, between minus two and plus two. Um, now, if you start to think about this as a search problem, you know, how many sequences are there? Two to the 1160, that is about 10 to the 350, okay? Um, so there are quite a few, okay? So you have to, so it, it, there's no hope for enumeration or anything. Uh, I actually wanted to point out one little thing here. You know, where, why, how does inference come into when you think of this problem? Well, let's say we, we're here, um, so we're having up till this point, okay, in this sequence, and this subsum is two, okay? Now we can do a little inference. We can say, wait a minute, if this is two here, I cannot have a one here, because then I would go to three, okay? So it means that the next entry has to be a minus two, okay? So while you're building these subsums up, uh, you get these kind of little inference steps that you say, okay, I know something about my sequence. And that's what the reasoning programs do. They, they look for, and this is just a very small example, but of course it happens at lots of places. Uh, it's going to happen when you see a minus two come. You know the next one has to be plus one, okay? So uh, it all has to fit together, okay? So what I want to do is, is, is say a little more about how this is done uh, and why it's interesting, okay? So, um, ah, so first I have here, uh, this is the sequence, okay? Uh, and you can, of course, write a very little program that checks this. 
and it works beautifully. Uh, so, um, so I put it in a 40 by 29 pattern. I've actually, uh, of course, we're going to do some deep learning on this, but we, we have never done that. But I wonder, like, what is predictive? What you can predict from one, one part of the sequence to the next part? Um, but um, let me see. Okay. Um, so a part of my problem, my, my point in this talk is to stress that this was done <coughs> with a general propositional reasoning engine. It was not done with any specialized reasoner for this problem. Um, in fact, there's a, a fairly well-known polymath project, which is a group project to do, to do mathematics with over the web. Everybody can contribute. It was started in 2010, and it went for a number of years. Uh, and people would write specialized programs for this problem, like you know, and, and then you know, the, the most advanced ones would 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 build on known types of other sequences and try to modify those other sequences. Um, but they couldn't come close to 1160. I mean, towards the end, I think they were up to 1120, which is pretty good. But early on, they were down to like you know 100, 200 that they could find the longest sequence. Okay. So they really, you know, and the project actually sort of died out because, you know, we're going to come to the, the next thing is what about 1161? But, but, so, but they couldn't really get, you know, you want to answer this question one way or the other. Uh, is there a, a, a sequence that, that, that can always stay within plus, minus one, and, and plus, uh, minus two, and plus two? Uh, we are really interested now if it gets too long, maybe you, you will go out of that range, okay? Uh, but... This, this people that looked at the specialized solvers, uh, specialized programs, a lot of math, of course this was done by mathematicians, so they're really interested in, in group theory, et cetera. So they used you know, the, the best ideas they had, basically. But they couldn't get close until somebody from the, I think somebody from the uh, satisfiability world, the, the, it's called Boolean satisfiability solvers, or SAT solvers, SAT solvers, um, until somebody picked up this problem and says, let me just give it to a solver, okay? Um, now, the person was a little lucky because solvers five years ago couldn't solve this. Okay? Solvers now can. So it was also a question of timing. Okay? Um, ah, so just a little taste of, you know, when I say so, translate to satisfiability problem, just a little taste of, of what that looks like. Uh, this is not, this is actually not from this particular uh, Mass problem. This is from the world of verification. Just to give you a flavor, um, you know, we tend to. So There's a header that just says that this is in conjunctive normal form, which is just a particular logical format. The variables are, are numbered, so from one to uh, I think I, I've got like several thousand variables uh, are in this formula. Uh, and when we use very simple notation, minus one means that variable is negated, so not x1, or X7, and that's our first little disjunction, okay? Little clause, as we call it. And we have to satisfy it by either setting X1 to false, because then this becomes true and we're done, or we set X7 to true and we're done too, okay? So now what you see here, you see all these minus ones, so you might actually already suggest, well, maybe we should set X1 to false. Uh, then we'll satisfy those first, uh, uh, you know, Seven, I forgot the six, seven clauses. Uh, the zeros, by the way, is just the end marker of the clause. Okay? So, um, now the goal is, given uh, a set of clauses, each variable is a Boolean variable, true or false, find a setting for the variables um, that satisfies all these clauses, all these constraints, or show that no such setting exists. Okay? That's the goal of the satisfiability solver. Um, Make it a little bit more interesting. So here's a little bit later on a clause. This one here, you know, you see this is much more interesting. It has many, many variables. It also has one, not negated. Okay, so maybe we actually have to set x1 uh, to true. You know, uh, because maybe that's the only way to set. We don't know. That could be the only way to satisfy this clause. Okay, so this is of course what makes the reasoning problem interesting and makes it hard. It's an MP-complete problem, one of the first problems uh, in computer design to be shown. Actually, it's the first problem to be shown in MP-complete, but giving evidence that maybe the best possible algorithm has to take exponential time if NP is not equal P. Um, and that's still the status. We believe actually NP is not equal P, so we believe that in the worst case, 
This really requires two to the n time where n is the number of variables, okay? Now, if that was the real story about complexity, uh, you know, not much could be done, and sometimes we would be in real trouble, okay? It turns out that many problems we're interested in, including the mass problem I just put up, uh, the worst case complexity is far better, far better than this, than this exponential behavior, and we'll see that in a moment, okay? So, um, 4,000 pages. So the clauses, they do get more interesting. So this is some verification problem, uh, fairly, fairly old one, but uh, 15,000 pages, okay? Here you have one, like this final statement says, the variable 185, which is probably an input variable to the circuit um, that might be fixed at plus one. So you have to set this to true to satisfy this clause. But now what about the rest, okay? So this problem has about 50,000 uh, variables. So it has a search space, a raw search space of 2 to the 15,000, uh, sorry, of 10 to the 15,000. Uh, and if satisfiability was truly exponential um, for most instances, let's say in the typical case, you could never solve this, okay? You cannot, you know, my, my guide is you can search space of about 10 to the uh, 12, 10 to the 14 maybe, uh, exhaustively, but that's, <clears throat> that's sort of the limit. Um, 10 to the 1500 is, is infeasible. However, as I said, there's much more structure, so uh, current set solvers solve this particular instance in a, in a fraction, of a few seconds, okay? Um, and you know, this, this was unsolvable about 20 years ago, and now it's down to a few seconds, okay? So, uh, and in fact, this instance may even be unsatisfiable. So it's, it goes both for satisfiable, where you find the assignment, but this instance, I think, is unsatisfiable, and the solver will say in a few seconds, there's no solution, okay? So implicitly, cleverly, it's searching this space, but of course, it's doing nowhere near an exhaustive search, okay? So back to our sequences, okay? Uh, so just a little bit about how we encode things. Uh, we just have variables for the sequence. These are the obvious things. So we have n plus ones and minus one, so we get x1 through xn as our first set of Boolean variables. Uh, and we interpret, you know, if, if in our solution we find x1 to be true, um, then we, 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 we take that to mean it's, it's plus one, and in our encoding, and if it's in the final solution has x1 set to false, we take it to be minus one, okay? And if it's unsatisfiable in our encoding, if our encoding is unsatisfiable, it means that there is no sequence um, that, that stays within minus one and plus, minus two and plus two, okay? Now, a little bit more interestingly, uh, you, know, you couldn't quite encode, you know, these are the starting variables. You need a few more variables. You need variables that, that sort of make sense. They're not, it's not difficult, this is sort of a, very straight, and once you, you, you get used to these kind of encodings, it's a very straightforward encoding, but when you first see it, it looks maybe a little strange. We're gonna have propositions of the following form. The sum of the first two terms of the step by two subsequence uh, is a propositional variable. Uh, is, 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 sorry, no, that's not the proposition. Uh, we wanna know what value that is, okay? So that can be two, for example, and this will be true or false. This is basically saying, you know, if I add up so my, let me just quickly, I think it's, yeah. So if, if I go in the first two terms uh, of, of, the, of, this, uh, of this sum of the, of the step by, I, I did it do step by two or the step by one? A step by two maybe. Oh, I guess now I actually, okay, I might have an error on this slide. So, so step by two, yeah. one plus one is not fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 so it actually gets to two, so it will be true, okay? Uh, I just realized there's another, because I want to get on, on, on this guy, so let me just actually, let me. So we, we, can, we can, basically, we have variables that, that allow us to talk about these partial sums, and of course we're gonna have many of them, and they talk about the values of those sums, okay? And for any given setting of the original patterns, uh, of the original, uh, and plus ones minus one, you know, these predicates will, will evaluate to, to true or false, okay? Because they actually encode what, what the sums are, okay? Um, and then we ask, you know, we, you know, these are the variables, okay? And now we have statements, and I think this is, yeah, so this actually should be x9, but so, 
if the sum of the first two terms uh, uh, of the step two subsequent is two, if that's true, then we know something about that next thing. We don't want to go higher. So we have to, we, we, you know, this should be x9, by the way. That, that, that next step should, should be minus one, okay? Because otherwise we'll go to three, okay? So here we have, if we have these two obser observations, oh, sorry, that, what, what we're actually encoding, we have these two observations, this should be x9. Uh, now that means that the, the sum of the first three terms of the uh, step by two subsequent and goes down by one, okay? So true goes, so remains true, uh, but we're encoding what happens depending on, again, this should be x9, what happens depending on that next value, okay? So this is a little, little logical encoding of what, how these sums change, okay? And, and that's all, really. I mean, there's not much more to it. Um, so, um, now, if you do the actual work, and I actually did that just to just to double check it, so you get a problem with about thirty-seven thousand four hundred eighteen variables, um, and about you know, one hundred sixty-one thousand four hundred sixty clauses, and that's actually not a large problem for current solvers. Okay, um, and in fact, uh, on my MacBook Air, I found the secrets in about an hour. Okay, uh, so the doable. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, you might actually wonder, you know, maybe the set solver is just lucky in finding the sequence, okay? Um, and, and there's always, you know, that, that worry, <laughs> I guess, that, that maybe it's, it's just a fluke. Um, but we, we're going we're gonna to check that. And, and I think, you know, how, how we know that's not the case is if I make it one longer, and this, I think, is the real result, okay, then I can show that encoding becomes unsatisfiable, okay? Meaning, no matter what sequence I pick of 1161 plus ones and minus ones, at some point, one of these subsequent, there will have every sequence, there will be some point where the sum goes to plus three or minus three. Okay? That encoding, look at that, encoding is not, oops, you know, the encoding is only slightly bigger because you only have one more uh, bit. Uh, so 37,000, you know, 462, a few extra clauses, okay? And now you fire up the, uh, the solver, and in about 10 hours, it's a little longer, 10 times longer, but actually, uh, it's, it's multi-threaded, so it still does about an hour. Um, but uh, my MacBook Air told me it's unsatisfiable, okay? So basically, um, there is no setting. And, and it shows that you search, that, that in some sense, you search the whole space. So it's not like you were lucky to hit a solution for that 1160. Because if I give it a space where I have to search the whole thing, it also figures it out, okay? So, uh, and this is the interesting part, so 13 gigabyte. Uh, and now you can actually print out that proof, um, the proof of that unsatisfiability. Why is it unsatisfiable? Okay, you can print that, the steps of the proof out. Now, the proof steps, I've just given a little example here. The proof steps are very basic. So they're literally, you know, they start with the original clauses and then basically says how you should combine them together, okay? Uh, and you get statements like this, you know, three lines, A and not B, give C. So you can now write C as the next step in the proof, okay? That level of proof, that's why we can have a 50-line, you know, order 50-line program that takes that, um, 13 gigabyte proof, which has about a billion inference steps, and check it, okay? And everybody can write their own little checker and, and just do it, uh, and now you're certain, okay, that that's actually correct. Um, now, of course, what we're left with is, uh, you know, the machine can understand this. Um, the human never really understands the proof, I guess, but for the machine, a billion steps uh, is not such a big deal. Uh, but the key thing is we can be certain of the result, okay? Um, and that, you know, that's my first observation. Uh, it, it's, it's different than early, you, you might have read, you know, these results now and then hit the press. Probably the most famous one was the four-color theorem um, that was done in the 1970s that any planar map 
can be colored with four colors um, that two countries that border uh, have two different colors, okay? Um, this was a famous open problem in, in graph theory, um, and it was resolved by Hagen, Hagen and Apple in, uh, I think, 19, 90, late 1960s, early 1970s, okay? And it was a huge, it was, it was a, for those days, it was a huge uh, computer proof that checked um, really rejected thousands or tens of thousands of special cases uh, of the coloring problem. Uh, the problem was when that was when it was published, and, and it was quite controversial. In part, it was controversial because how would you really know uh, that the, the theorem prover they used to check all these cases was itself correct? Okay, it was uh, you know hundreds of lines of code, uh, I mean, probably thousands actually. Uh, so, and, and in fact, uh, when people, so the only thing people could think of is, well, let's try to replicate it by independent groups. And actually, in that replication, a few missing cases were discovered. Uh, they were added and the proof remained correct, okay? But that the only confidence was over time, I think it has been done two or three times at least, uh, Redone the proof with a different theory improver, new code, getting the same result. Uh, I can color all maps. Uh, so that's how people build up confidence. But it's not quite satisfactory for mathematicians because, uh, well, maybe everybody has a subtle bug in their in their theory improver. And proving uh, and and you know showing these kind of theory improvements correct, a uh, program's correct is, is almost infeasible. Uh, so the difference here is you can throw away the stat solver. I give you the eight gigabyte file, you check it, okay? Um, actually, yeah, and this, this is moving fast. The, the, the record now is a 12, 12 terabyte uh, <laughs> proof that, that just a few weeks ago came out uh, for a, a problem about uh, coloring of uh, Pythagoras, uh, Pythagorean triples. Uh, so there's another result that has not 12 terabyte proof. Uh, but anyway, the proof is out there. You can download it and you can check it. Uh, Second thing, uh, a bit of confusion always. You know, people sort of think of these solvers as doing brute force search. Uh, it really is not, okay? Um, if it was brute force search, uh, earlier solvers could, could do it. You know, as I say, you could take an earlier solver, run it on current hardware, uh, and, and you would be able to do it. That's not the case at all. In fact, as I mentioned, specialized programs cannot find the proof. Uh, so, why is that? You know, the brute force proof, you can actually look at it, a very basic satisfiability solver. Uh, that didn't have all the smarts built in that we have now, would get a search tree um, that essentially is of the size of all possible input sequences. Because somehow, you know, a very basic uh, reasoner has to, has to consider them all, okay? So that's you know, 10 to the, about 10 to the 349 uh, inference steps. It was a dumb solver, okay? Um, the current solver, you know, finds a complete way. You can actually look at the trace at the end, it, it prints it out, and you'll find that it makes about 10 to the 10 uh, little inference steps. Uh, so that's a savings of a factor 10 to the 339. <laughs> so, uh, so it finds you know, a, a minuscule size proof compared to sort of brute force search, uh, and it's also able to find the proof. You know, it's not just that, that the proof is much shorter, it has to find it among, you know, this search space, okay? So that's the difference. So it's not really, it actually has smarts built in. Uh, and, you know, we, we hope that they will just get better and better. Okay? Um, so, what, you know, what was the follow-up on this? You know, this was 2015, got a lot of publicity uh, because of the Polymass project. The first time, you know, this Erdos problem was open for about 40 plus years. The first time any progress was made, you know, so it's sort of strange, you know, intuitively you might say, ah, yeah, sure that. You can't, you can't contain those sequences, but, but nobody was able to prove it, even for, for discrepancy two. Uh, but after this was proved, and there was some other advantage, I should mention that there were some other very subtle advantages in these, in these properties of the sequences, in terms of tau, then proved uh, in the general case, meaning uh, for any finite discrepancy, if your sequence gets long enough, your, your, your sums cannot stay within that finite uh, discrepancy. So this was a, you know, a mathematical two to the force, uh, um, deep and subtle mass. Uh, but I, I do 
you know, and actually if you go to Turner's original paper, he did borrow a bit from you know, some of the intuition that came out of these computer proofs uh, about you know, certain properties of these sequences. So, so there was some sort of carryover, and he knew that it was true, I guess. So um, that helped uh, for the case of two. Um, I would even take it a step further. It doesn't really, so this general result is of course a limit result. Uh, result. So in the limit, so, so you know, what they do in these proofs, they consider a hugely, you know, uh, very long sequence, and look, look at what happens when n goes to infinity. And that's how you get these results. Um, it doesn't actually, you know, Terence Tao's result does not imply, you know, 1161 uh, is infeasible uh, because his limits are, are much larger numbers. Um, so, um, so there's there's something coming out of this proof that still is not actually replicated uh, in a human way. Um, and this is an interesting idea that that future mass. Uh, you know, mass, of course, you know, it's just like any human endeavor. It sort of it, it goes to what we can do. Okay, it doesn't explore things that we cannot do. Uh, but uh, but now you you get mathematicians complemented by these machine reasoning systems, and they will give us now facts that that are true and verifiable by the machine. Uh, and now we can use it as a mathematician. So that's sort of an exciting time where we will see mass sort of starting to explore things and starting to use facts to say, okay, this is computer. Uh, generated proof and verified, verifiable. Uh, I'm going to build on that, okay? Uh, and, and I'm sort of hoping that we're going to see some interesting developments there. Um, okay, just so I'm actually almost done. So, uh, so I hope I'm giving you some reason that this is sort of it's a different kind of a world, the, the reasoning world. But my hope is that we're going to uh, going to merge. And in fact. AlphaGo is a bit of an example of that. So AlphaGo, you know, is really is a breakthrough, uh, but as as a as an inference or a reasoning based purpose, I, I was very aware of this step, Monte Carlo tree search, uh, which happened in 2006. And and if you looked at you know how chess was done, checkers was done, all minimax searches, uh, very basic uh, game tree search, and that doesn't work for Go because you don't have a good evaluation function. So in 2006, the UCT, uh, which is a, is a very clever kind of Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, got around this problem of not knowing you know, whether a board is good or bad by, doing, by taking a board and then doing a random play out. So you make both players play randomly and see who wins. Okay? It's very counterintuitive in the sense that you know, if you randomly play, uh, you get very weird uh, Games that, that have nothing to do with actual games. So, you, so who wins and loses in the end? You might say, how can it be any good? Uh, uh, and that sort of uh, my actually my intuition is nobody had tried this before because it seems too weird to even try. Okay, uh, so. What's the intuition? Why can it work? Well, so I give you a board, let's say from a grandmaster game, and I ask you who's winning, you know, and I can take two very bad players and have them play, and I repeat it a few times, and uh, and if if you know which side wins the majority of the games, that side will have a little advantage, even though these players are all far weaker than grandmaster players. So there is something in that board already that no matter how you play. Uh, you, you, you know, as long as both players are equally weak, that's that's the intuition. So now random is about as weak as you can get. Uh, so as long as both players are random, you get some information, and that's what what was found in this Monte Carlo tree search. Is you get a little bit of information there, uh, and now you combine that with search. When the search is, looks very similar to to minimax search, a, little, a few tweaks. Okay, so this was the real breakthrough in 2006. Well, I should be careful with the real, but it was a breakthrough. Um, and there, that w boosted the um, the go level up to I think there you know middle middle level amateur. Uh, and, and suddenly people said, no, maybe go is solvable. Okay, that's that's up till then people said go is not solvable. Go is solvable. Now it becomes a timeline question: how long will it take? Uh, and uh, so then. Uh, uh, Alpha Go came in and and sort of added uh, added reinforcement learning, deep learning, basically improved the playouts uh, strategy. Uh, so they did a beautiful piece of work, 
but combined it with the Monte Carlo tree search. If you take the Monte Carlo tree search out, you're not going to have a good Go playing program. So it's really the synthesis of these uh, techniques uh, that makes things go. And that's, I think, where sort of the future will lie, where we start combining things that we knew how to do in the past with deep learning uh, and possibly reinforcement learning. Um, so, um, oh, these are just some general comments, I guess. I mean, we can do this. this yeah. An exciting area for me is sort of also this this um, this uh, plan synthesis, which is like program synthesis. So where we have programs that generate programs, uh, and they they will synthesize uh, programs for us, uh, or like a robot that synthesizes plans on the fly. Um, and it's a very different paradigm than what programmers are used to. The programmers are used to pre-programming industrial robots. Uh, I found an interesting story about Sony, uh, not Sony, um, Toyota, I guess, who at some point, this was uh, around 2010, actually reduced the use of robots in their factories. Okay? The, w the reason they reduced it is because they found re uh, you know, reprogramming the robots for new models was actually too expensive. So, so the robots, the emotions are very carefully pre-programmed. Uh, so they realized actually the software development was too expensive, and they went back to more humans, you know, which are a little bit more flexible. But you know, in, the, in what's happening now is humans, the robots will start using more general planning algorithms. You don't have to reprogram them every time, uh, and they will be back in action. So. Uh, this is just to give you uh, something to think about. So, so this is our, you know, how computer scientists think about uh, you know, computational complexity. There's this very nice class here, the polynomial time uh, solvable problem, especially linear time or even sublinear time problems are all in there. Uh, you know, short, 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 these are the, the, the things that are really uh, used the most, linear programming. Uh, and, um, but then there's this, this next level up. And we used to avoid those, because these, these are uh, MP-complete. We, we used to sort of avoid those uh, because they are, in worst case, exponential. Uh, but as I've shown you for the solvers, uh, the SAT solvers, this almost feels like in practice it collapses into P. Okay, so, so, so MP-completeness, you don't have to worry about that much anymore. Uh, unless you're into cryptography. So cryptography works specifically to create very hard MP-complete problems that are that are average case MP-complete in some sense. So, so, so they're, they, they're still able to exploit it. So the theory is still all working. It's just whether the typical case uh, is that hard or not. So we feel it's much more closer to P for the typical case. But now look at all what's above it, OK? So um, there is counting, which is much more related to probabilistic inference. Uh, there is uh, you know, game playing, planning uh, with adversarials, multi-agent system, P-space, uh, and then exponential. Uh, I guess what we know for sure is that P is not the same as, XP, as exponential, but we, this could, in principle, we collapse down, although we don't believe that will happen. Uh, so, but if I had to put, you know, so this is, gets a little more controversial. <laughs> so I think you know, humans are, uh, are there. But now machines are starting to tackle this. Now how are machines are starting to tackle this? Uh, Stefano Ehrman probably gave a talk uh, like, uh, last Monday. Uh, taking things like uh, counting and sampling and being very clever and basically adding some further clauses to it in some randomized way, collapsing this problem down to an MP-complete problem and then calling a SAT solver or uh, mixed integer programming package. So, so there's quite a bit of work now where they take problems and map them down. There's, there's something you lose. You lose optimality guarantees, but you get good approximation guarantees. So you may not be able to count exactly um, by doing that trick, but you can count approximately by doing that trick. So they're taking problems from here and mapping them down. So, uh, so there's a lot of excitement uh, in sort of the, and the, the, in seeing that happen. And a lot of it is possible because a million variable problem, a 10 million variable problem, those are solvable now. You know, if that wasn't doable, none of this, none of this would be interesting. Uh, so there's a real shift to uh, to orders of magnitude. And given the push from the verification industry, the hardware industry, software industry. I see these solvers go to 10 million, 100 million variables and in a billion clauses, for example. Uh, and then you can do a whole lot of stuff here by mapping it down. Okay? And this is then, uh, so my last comment here, you know, what are the consequences for human understanding of machine intelligence? You know, there are some real 
questions, you know, to what extent can we understand what the machine is doing? The machine can even give, so, so the good scenario is where we have the proof, and you can write a little program and check it, and, and hundreds of thousands of people can just check it for themselves and say, okay, I don't quite understand the proof here, but it's correct, okay? There's a slightly more difficult area, uh, which you see in the game playing program, like Go and, 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 and even some like chess, where there is no short proof. So there is no short proof of why a certain chess move is good. It's just that uh, Deep Blue or Alpha Go in, 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 uh, uh, for Go, Alpha Go gives you a, 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 a digress, the best move it can find and say, okay, trust me, you know, this is a great move. Um, there's no explanation for it. So there's a whole area that, that worries about the question, how can you verify something? How can you give a, a, what's called a witness for a certain result? Uh, and, and I gave you an example where there is a short witness. There is a, you say, a gigabyte is not that short, but it's short enough. Okay. There's a witness. For these go-playing programs or the chess programs, there is no witness. So all you can do is, well, I wrote my own chess program, my own AlphaGo program. I get the same move prediction. There is no no other way to verify the computation. Uh, and that sort of leaves this issue of you know, how we're going to trust these programs that they really are doing the right move, or is AlphaGo trying to trick me uh, into doing something very dumb? Uh, but I will not know it. Okay? So there's sort of, you know, maybe we have to develop a notion of trust or have other programs watch the programs uh, making their moves. But it's not so easy. Uh, I think the example I gave is the verifiable proof is a very nice case of where it is checkable, but in general it's not. So, okay, and I think that's it actually. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, let's take a couple of questions. Um, I'm puzzled by, uh, so with the, the distinction between Go and chess in this, I assume you're both, you're in both cases talking about if you have like larger boards, uh, larger instances of games right. like these, why the distinction between chess and Go, though? Oh, actually, so is that on this slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think um, it's a little bit how it's generalized. I guess I, I, I think I did chess a bounded number of moves here. Um, when you have a bounded number of moves, if you allow a potential exponential number of moves, it goes up in, in complexity. If you would do bounded go, it would go one. So it can I win in 50 moves or 100 moves? It goes down to piece space. So there's no, both, both of these results are, are always questionable in the sense that, you know, we have to make some generalization about the problem size. And it's, it's somewhat artificial. Uh, you know, you're much more interested in what is the actual complexity of 8x8 chess or 19x19 19 Go. The problem is complexity theory will tell you it's constant time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so that's a pretty you know, bad answer. Uh, so, so we generalize some, and, and so the difference there it comes from how, you, how we've generalized it. Yeah, so, yeah. There you go. Other questions or? Hey, one. Sure. I think this is the most optimistic chart I have seen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think that if Tom Dietrich were still here. Oh, yeah, yeah, he doesn't. <laughs> he so I can, I can like channel the spirit of Tom oh, Dietrich. Oh, channel the spirit. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think there's like a certain type of brute forcing that machines can do to do, uh, you know, solve quote, solve, end quote, and be hard problems that humans know how to solve in principle, but don't know how to solve in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also this thing where, like, uh, uh, humans are able to sort of, like, find the, uh, like, find the clever, uh, like, way to cut the search base down dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and it's this latter thing that seems like what you really need to do if you want to say machines can solve and be hard mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. I was but wondering how that ties into machine reasoning. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's a very good point. So, so, but that's exactly what I. That's actually what I was trying to say about these solvers. They they find these shortcuts. You know, that's that's. We've actually done a lot of work ourselves on, on sort of trying to explain how these solvers can find these these very large uh, deal with with millions of variables and and they have a. It's called clause learning. They actually have a component. That tries to that, that learns new 
uh, new implications while it's searching adds it to the problem. Uh, you know, if you have a problem with a, with, a, with a million clauses, they can add 10, 20, 30 million implications. It finds you in the search. And it's, it's sort of clever about which ones it keeps around. It keeps around ones that are most useful for future part of the search. So we, we found these solvers are actually, and sometimes memory, like when, if human can solve it with clever reasoning, these, these solvers will, will rediscover that. Uh, and that's actually sort of the secret of it. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so it's not a brute force thing. It's really finding, you know, I, I call it, you know, uh, mental shortcuts, you know, shortcuts in the proof, but the solvers will find those too. So, uh, so it may not be such a, so the question is like, are humans still better at it? One, one area where humans are currently still outperforming uh, in, like in, in the mathematical reasoning area, um, machines is, is coming up with abstractions. So certain kinds of you know, mathematical abstractions that humans are so good at, uh, we're still very bad at in machine reasoning. But I could see that change, you know, that, that we're now able to do things that, you know, that, that we could maybe do in principle 10 years ago, but we never could do in practice. Uh, more and more you see, uh, see machines actually start look, looking for abstractions, for example and apply those to the proofs, so, yeah. So, do you think that the NP's uh, problems perhaps should be cut into two, into like those that you are really key in like the majority of prob probabilistically of cases, yeah. and those that are not like crypto yeah. versus SAT? Crypto versus SAT, so basically I, I think so this, and, and really sort of, it's, it's the NP-complete ones that are up here. Yeah, that has to be, I think there's a very small corner here. <laughs> Which, which is, which I guess you know, there was actually some work called on average MP completeness, average case MP completeness, but also by, done by Levin, one of the co-good discoveries of MP completeness, who exactly looks at that notion and says, I want a notion of MP completeness that I generate a random instance, uh, and it's still hard. And he identified it. it, it I guess this problem you know, having to do with parity kind of constraints. It's a sort of a or a lattice-based problem. It's a lattice-based problem. Uh, it's the most difficult paper to read. Nobody can can read it. It's so like half a page long. It's a Russian uh, style. Uh, so so that's why most people missed it. Uh, I guess it's, you can't understand it. But but and it has now slowly people have started to make sense of it. But it's a very small corner here, and that's I think the kind of thing you're, you're pointing at. So I could see the whole thing collapse down in practicality, uh, except for that little. Uh, uh, cryptographic corner. Uh, and that's actually an interesting thing because that's, you know, what we're finding is, you know, as I said, these test solves are very powerful, but sometimes they can't do it at all. So, so they, they, they can lead to certain frustration. Uh, and that's because sometimes in your encoding, you might accidentally create a little cryptographic subproblem that your solver can't handle. And that's when they can't do it. So it's something we need to understand better. Yeah. In your head, do you think that the part that is collapsing is like NP intersect co NP, or do you think that it's different NP. from that? Yeah, I mean that. That, but yeah, that that I could see collapse. So when you say collapse, sort of in practical terms. Yeah, practical. In practical terms, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. So the question again could be some cryptographic subset that 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 is average case hard could be in there. I'm not, I'm not even sure anybody has formulated that. I'm just but, suspicious by the fact that yeah. like the proof was yeah. also short in the problem yeah. that was solved. Yeah. It's yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes hand in hand. I guess the problem if if the proofs weren't short. You know, that's the thing. So when we looked at, you know, how can these set solvers do it, it, you know, part of the reaction people have is, oh, they, you know, when a problem is satisfiable, they're just lucky to find an assignment. You know, and that's just not the case. You know, if you go slightly, you know, add in a few more constraints, there are no solutions, they find short proofs. But it does go hand in hand. There have to be short proofs in the space, otherwise the problem is not doable. And, in fact, the few hardness results that are known, like for random 3SAT, uh, where we have no way of dealing with it uh, when the problems are unsatisfied, there is a proof that those proof there's a proof <laughs> that those proofs are long, are too long, exponentially long. So, so the, the notion of short proofs and easiness and doable uh, all come together. Yeah, so which is good. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's thank Bart again. Okay. Thanks.